North Wales children's homes in the 70s and 80s, the scene of the most depraved child abuse imaginable. Vulnerable children in care, raped by the very people paid to look after them. One particular night that I always recall is when I was basically raped, tied down and abused by nine different men, sexually. This was Bryn Estyn, a children's home at the centre of the North Wales child abuse scandal. These were allegations of widespread physical and sexual abuse, not just at the hands of the staff who worked here, but of children lent out to others. These were allegations of a paedophile ring involving people from all walks of life, businessmen, a market trader, a senior public figure. This was a paedophile ring that stretched beyond the Welsh borders, to Chester, the south coast, London and beyond. Um, in the home, it was the normal standard abuse where it was violence and sexual. Outside, it was basically like as if you were sold. Um, we were taken in particular to the Crest Hotel in Wrexham, um, mainly on Sunday nights where they would rent rooms. In the early 1990s, historic allegations of child abuse started to surface. In March 1994, Clwyd County Council commissioned an independent inquiry into allegations of widespread abuse across North Wales. Professor Jane Tunstill was one of the inquiry panel. To cut to the chase, obviously, our report was not published um, and indeed we were required to send back our numbered copies to Clwyd uh, for them to be pulped in order for the local authority to maintain its insurance cover also had the effect of meaning that they could not apologise or be seen as taking seriously the allegations of the young people. It was this that prompted the then Tory government to announce a full judicial inquiry. The North Wales Child Abuse Tribunal, headed by the late former High Court Judge Sir Ronald Waterhouse, heard evidence from more than 650 former residents of children's homes. Horrific stories of physical and sexual abuse. The inquiry promised to leave no stone unturned. As for allegations against the rich and powerful, counsel for the inquiry mentioned the existence of a shadowy figure of high public standing, but said there was no substantial evidence to support the allegations. I believe that there will be any further uh, prosecutions simply because the report has now been published, that the evidence within the tribunal has already been considered by the Crown Prosecution Service. If something further was to emerge, then obviously it would be reconsidered. Since the Jimmy Savile abuse allegations surfaced, politicians have been raising questions about other historic abuse cases. Tom Watson MP speaking last week during Prime Minister's questions. The evidence file used to convict paedophile Peter Wrighton if it still exists, contains clear, clear intelligence of a widespread paedophile ring. In our original investigation in the 1990s, Peter Wrighton was linked with a North Wales children's home and via that to a prominent Tory politician at the time. We had interviews with alleged victims. Newsnight and the Bureau of Investigative Journalism went back to Steve Meesham this week. He stands by what he told me then. But you were taken by care. Um where basically you were just sexually abused. Various things would happen, drink would be involved. Um, it was basically rape. Um, but there wouldn't be just him, there'd be other people involved as well. Can you tell me, you know, the instant, how many times did this happen? How many times were you abused by this man? Um, off my head, I wouldn't, I wouldn't give an exact number because obviously I'm going back many, many years, but, but certainly more than a dozen. And how were you introduced to him? Um, I was basically taken to him by a car, um, which I, again, I've said in the tribunal. Uh, cars would pull up outside the home and you were taken and there would be a Porsche, there, there'd be a Jag, there'd be all different cars and you were taken. The abuse occurred in the late 1970s. Stephen went to the police. I was called a liar. I was pinned up against the wall. I can still name the police officer to this day who'd done it. Um, the police denied it, and when they look back, they finally admitted in the inquiry, statements were made. That's all they would say. They wouldn't say who was named in them, but they actually did admit, I did make statements of sexual abuse. And you're saying that you made these statements of sexual abuse against this senior public figure? Yes, I am. 
And in the early 1990s, as allegations of child abuse in North Wales started to surface, another victim came forward. We interviewed him for a previous investigation for BBC Radio 5 Live, broadcast in the year 2000. We've been unable to track him down for this report, but he described then how, as a teenager, he was preparing to leave care, getting ready for a job in the outside world. He wished to remain anonymous. He picked me up one night and we went to have drinks, to a pub to meet somebody on the promise of a job. And then I was asked if I would meet this person again, and I didn't think there was anything to it. So I met him in a car park in Wrexham. That was where I was told to meet him. And then we went out for something to eat and he pulled over in a lay-by and then, hey presto, oral sex took place. He gave me some money. For some strange reason, he was going on about Christmas and a Christmas box. I don't know. He was probably just trying to keep me quiet. I don't know. Were you, at that time, over the age of consent? Was I over the age? No. I was still in the children's home. At the time, in the early 1990s, he went to North Wales Police. He showed them faxed photographs of the senior Tory politician. So in front of two police officers, you picked out yeah, the photographs? Yeah, and then they turned around and they said they are faxed photographs, they are not really reliable, that it wouldn't be a positive ID, and because they weren't there to see it, is could have been anyone, and I think that's the way they looked at it. And they took no further action? No further action. It may well be that the case was dropped purely because of a lack of evidence. In the late 1990s, both Stephen and our anonymous victim had another chance to name names at the North Wales Tribunal. But hopes were soon dashed. I don't understand why on earth we had an inquiry if we had to leave out 30% of the abusers. And basically, I was told to do that. I was told I couldn't go into detail about these people, I couldn't name them, and they wouldn't question me on them. Why? What reason did they give? They didn't give me a reason. They just said you were not allowed to do so. And again, he was not alone. What happened was they sent ex-police people to all the witnesses to make a statement. Then that statement was produced at the tribunal, and you were questioned from that statement. And your statement said nothing about this man. When I made a statement to the police, the police crossed it out and said there was no proof. What was the point? Everyone said there was no point. I mean, I never thought that. That's what... But the inquiry was your chance to tell someone in power what you believed happened to you. No, 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 no. The questions were picked from your statement, and you were asked questions from that statement. Solicitor Richard Scorer represented 30 victims at the inquiry. He believes the original remit and attitudes at the time were at the heart of the problem. The tribunal looked into the abuse of children in care in North Wales and not beyond. Well, there were certainly allegations of that kind that were alluded to at the inquiry, but they weren't allegations that the inquiry could pursue or explore or investigate in great detail because they were outside those terms of reference. That's the terms of reference. Do you think the will was there in the inquiry to fully investigate some of the evidence that was, was coming up? I think the inquiry wanted to investigate where it could. I think the terms of the in terms of reference were an important restriction. I think it's also fair to say that at that time, and we're going back to the mid to late 1990s here, at that time, the idea that senior public figures, politicians, celebrities could be involved in child abuse was seen as a bit far-fetched. Um, we now know, of course, from recent revelations that it isn't far-fetched at all, and that's part of the reason why it's important that these allegations are looked at again. And one of your clients was naming a senior public figure. Well, these allegations were certainly alluded to in the inquiry, but as I say, they weren't pursued because they weren't really within the terms of reference of the inquiry. The evidence that we've heard, that we've gathered over the last 20 years, remains the same. For now, there's simply not enough to name names. But what has changed is the attitude, the public attitude towards child abuse. Given those making these allegations, renewed hope for the future. I'd like a meeting now with David Cameron. Um, he's made a statement, a sweeping statement, that um, abused people need to be believed. Um, we haven't been believed. We've been swept under the carpet. It's time he knew the truth. At time, a full investigation was taking place. 
And until I can meet with him and I get some reassurances, I don't believe we'd get anywhere.